Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha, everyone. My name is Peter Adler. I'm a planner, a mediator, an arbitrator, and also a member of Think Tech's board. And for the last several months, I've been doing a deep dive on one of the biggest issues coming up for all of us on November 6th. I haven't decided which way I'm going to vote, but I'm committed to understanding the question. This special three-part think tech series is called Hawaii's Big Choice, Should We Have a New Constitutional Convention? And that question, along with a second one regarding a special property tax to fund education, will be on the ballot when we vote on November 6th. Uh, today's series deals with the first question. Thus far, we've had three concons. The first was in 1959, when we were required to have one if we were to be a state. The second one was in 1968, and the third was in 1978. 68 and 78 produced important amendments and revisions. Since then, 40 years have gone by, and we haven't revisited the Constitution through a citizen's convention. Should we? Is it time? If CONCONs are a mirror of the times, are there new challenges and problems that a CONCON should take up? And that is what you will be deciding on November 6th. In these three, and a, three half hour segments, we will take up different aspects of all of this. In this first one, we will try and give you a better understanding what, of what is at stake and how a CONCON works. In the second one, we will take a look at some of the proposals that might come on the table if voters approve one on November 6th. And in the third, we'll try to confront some of the bright hopes and dark fears that are embedded in the whole question. The CONCON issue isn't simple and has many different faces and textures. In fact, it's a little bit like the proverbial blind man trying to figure out what an elephant is. If there is one big Uber message to all three discussions is this. Let's get informed about what kind of elephant we are dealing with, think about the big yes or no choice, and above all, get out and vote. Meanwhile, to get us started, I've invited two friends and colleagues here to help think it through. Avi Seufer is dean of the William S. Richardson School of Law at UH. He teaches constitutional law and has written extensively on the federal constitution. Also with us is Rebecca Soon, a graduate of Avi's Law School, one of the participants in the, in the 2016 Native Hawaiian Constitutional Convention, and chief executive officer of Solutions Pacific, a consulting firm that helps clients navigate tough challenges. Avi, let's start with you. What is a constitution? Why does it matter? How does it link to all the other things we have that regulate us? Well, these days there are a lot of constitutions around the world, but uh, I guess Americans can claim pride of place. We were the first written constitution in the world, and we have great reverence for the constitution. It's constantly debated. It's often changed by judges and by citizens, and uh, a constitution is kind of the highest law. And in the American tradition, judges get to invoke it and sometimes to strike down what a more popular uh, entity might have enacted, a locality or the state. In, in Hawaii, we have a sort of unusual thing in this every 10 years popular vote on whether the Constitution should be amended or not. And as you mentioned, it has infrequently been so, but a lot of people think the 78 CONCON in particular was very important. One of the issues this time is well, if it's opened up, will it change much? And so part of the analysis is whether you're risk averse or not. And just what is a constitutional convention, since that's what we're talking about? Well, it can vary, and it's uh, controlled by a number of different entities themselves, including the legislature. Uh, what the CONCON puts forward is not the final word. The people get to vote up or down on what the CONCON puts forward, if there are reforms, if there is a CONCON. Uh, some of the issues that people these days talk about fear of losing our protections for public trust, Native Hawaiian issues, unions, and so on. One of the things that's changed is that it has become much easier for outside finances, for money contributions, to come to Hawaii or anywhere else. And so some of the fears are, well, there might be a big flow of outside money into Hawaii. The last time there was a CONCON, there was a sort of concerted popular effort to keep politicians out. And it was a very interesting group of people, many of whom first achieved recognition and later fame because of their role in the CONCON. And I guess I should reveal kind of the self-interest of the law school. It would be terrific if we had a CONCON from that perspective because we would be all over it in terms of our students and graduates. So full Employment Act for the lawyers. <laughs> Not lawyers, but our graduates. <laughs> your gradu all your graduates. Um, one more quick question. What, what is the link between the, the elements of the Constitution, which are all on, on a website, they're easy to access, 
and the thinking that has to go on in both the legislature and in the executive branch, and then on down into the county's charters and ordinances. What's the linkages here? Well, there are many. Uh, we have separation of powers, of course, so we have the legislature having its own authority, but sometimes the judges will say you went too far or not far enough. Uh, there is some control over the judiciary. You can change the way that the judges are selected, and the legislature would do that. The executive actually has a lot of authority in Hawaii, uh, so that even when appropriations are voted, for example, the governor decides whether or not to spend that money. In many places, the governor doesn't have that discretion. Hmm. So uh, we'll come back to some of those, but Becky, talk to us a little bit about the mechanics of a con con. If voters decide yes, what happens after that? If they decide no, what happens after that? Sure. So it's almost easier to start with what happens if voters vote no. Okay. So if voters say in November that, you know what, it's just not the right time for us to reopen our Constitution and to um, revisit some of the fundamental questions of, of our legal you know, basis here in the state of Hawaii, then we the question comes back up again in 10 years, um, as Dean Swifer mentioned. And in the interim, we're able to use our representative democracy process. So we continue can continue to do what we've done for the last 40 years, um, which is to try to propose amendments through our legislature. And in fact, there's been 72 amendments that have been proposed through the legislature since 1980. Um, and just over half of those passed, and just under half of them didn't pass successfully um, by the voters. But so there's still mechanisms in place to try to address some of the questions that would have to be taken up in the Constitution. But if voters say yes, it's time and um, we want to reopen it for whatever reasons um, individual voters may have, then it triggers a couple of different processes. First is sort of a logistics question. So the legislature has the authority to determine what the Constitutional Convention actually looks like. And it's almost more party planner than it is <laughs> <laughs> policy making. I mean, these que the questions are, do have implications, certainly, over how successful the delegates might be. But the legislature will need to decide in the 2019 session, their legis the normal legislative session, how many delegates, where they'll be. In 1978, for example, there were two per House district. So 102, 51 House districts across the state. Um, they'll need to decide questions like how long will it be? Uh, again, in 78, it was 75 days. Um, that was the length of the, of the convention. Very few of those questions are answered within the Constitution itself. Really only a few questions like, you have to have the Constitution five months or more before the next general election. So we can't just indefinitely put it off. But the legislature has to make some of those decisions about, OK, is, are these delegates going to get paid? Um, and that has some real implications over who can participate and who can't participate, right? If we're saying that delegates are not going to get paid, for example, then I mean we can immediately start thinking about the people that that excludes from being able to really functionally be able to run as, as delegates. Um, but the legislature will, in 2019, if, if the Constitutional Convention question is passed, they'll make a decision about all of those logistical questions, how long, how many, how much, and then some of the back support that we don't always think about. So and where, where it'll be held? Yeah. Where it would be held? Where is it going to be? There's, there are going to be staff support. You know, I heard um, some of the delegates through your awesome ConCon Salon, by the way, thanks for including <laughs> me in that fun exercise. No, I heard, you know, we heard from 68 and 78 delegates who talked about their ability to push through a number of their proposals really hinged on the LRB staff, you know, the Reference Bureau staff who were there doing research, who were there providing support, drafting. You know, you mentioned when we opened that I participated in the um, Native and AHA, the um, Constitutional Convention, to create a constitution that we'll be putting forward to our community. And in that process, I mean, who sat down and wrote the provisions and proposed things drove the conversation. So, and I, will, I know for a fact that those were young lawyers in the law school did Leoman's work, including yourself. A lot of them were, yeah, not everyone, but yeah. certainly a lot. Yeah. And so, what will happen after that, you know, once those decisions are made, is there will be some kind of a process for delegates to run, to be elected to those delegate seats. Um, and from there, they'll hold a constitution, no convention, sorry, hold a constitutional convention, um, be able to probably set a lot of their own rules about how the convention's going to go 
how the meetings are going to be held, is there going to be a chair? There'll be a lot of interesting maneuvering, the kind of stuff that we see at the legislature, honestly. So <laughs> um, we're, not, we're not stepping yeah. away from politics. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't either. <laughs> yeah. And from there, so the last piece of it just is that whatever comes out of that convention, as Dean Swifer mentioned, those proposals will be put back to the voters. So they don't automatically become part of the Constitution. They're put back to the voters. Likely at the next general election, there could be a special, but it's usually at the next general, um, and they would be voted on by all of us. And so there's really three three vote perspective votes. The first one is on November 6th, and that says yes or no, will we have one? The second one is for delegates, and the third one, assuming the delegates come to conclusions and proposed revisions, would come on somewhere around 2020, something like that. Yeah. Though if that goes forward. Uh, one thing to add, though, and I do hope everyone votes on November 6th for lots of reasons, but if there are ballots that are left blank, our courts have held that they count as negatives. So it's a sort of supermajority that has to say yes. It has to be a majority of all the voters who say yes, we want a con count. And that's one of those details that I think most people don't understand. Uh, it creates a bar, a higher bar for, for coming forward. Talk a, let's talk a little bit about what happened in 78, 68 also, but 78 was a pretty momentous convention. Why was it, why was it important? How many, what, what, what sticks out? Well, as I mentioned, some of those issues that people are now worried about losing were really articulated. Uh, the time was right. Uh, it was a relatively youthful convention, and I would say that they were not so risk averse. They said, we want to do some things for Native Hawaiians, and the public trust doctrine ought to be important in this state, and so on. Uh, the unions got more protection than they had had, and a lot more than they have in most states. So it was a moment of, uh, in, in retrospect, I think people would say progressive uh, ideals being enacted into our law. Becky, will you, anything you want to add on 78 especially, but on either of those, in, the importance of those conventions? Yeah. So. The, um, I mean, there were, we talk about some of the real flagship um, things that were passed, 78, you know, public um, workers, right to bargaining, collective bargaining in 78, private um, workers' rights to collective bargaining. And sort of, we think about those things sort of broadly, but they have some real particular things that happen for them. They sort of, these, these amendments set some of the foundational pathways that advocates and citizens could then try to enact on and to implement. And so, you know, you look at things like the bargaining units, and it's real easy to take it for, for granted, you know, as, but it's, you know, each county and state now has bargaining units that it, that it bargains with and it negotiates with. And so the rights that they protect um, around anything from whether or not we have, whether or not individuals that are working for our government have a grievance process, if they're, if they have any kind of negative action taken against them, or whether they have the right to take sick leave. I mean, these are things that we sort of take for granted today in both the public and the private sector, but they were not, you know, easily won things. And so those, those changes really set the groundwork to allow that to happen. Are those things that both of you are talking about uh, items that could have been done by the legislature? In other words, one of the one of the ideas of a con con is that a citizens convention uh, can essentially go over the heads of the legislature in forming some of the fundamentals. And some of those things, I'm wondering if they could have been done legally. Sure, I mean I would say yeah. so. Like the water commission, the water code. And yeah. So one of the important things that um, Dean Swifer talked about was the public trust doctrine. And so um, when we look at you know Article 11 that was really created, taking part Article 10 and adding into additional protections, really enshrined this idea of that the state holds in its trust for on behalf of the people of Hawaii protections around all natural resources and then and then very clearly stated land water etc and with respect to water you talked about the water code came very quickly after that and then became the foundation upon which um, the Commission on Water Resource Management was formed and then became the basis for lawsuits when there was belief that the Commission on Water Resource Management wasn't making decisions in accordance with that constitutionally protected um, right. And so absolutely all those things could have happened through a legislative process. The question of would they have happened, would there have been the political will or the foresight and ability to pull all those pieces together, I think is a separate question. Great, and, there's, and there's a certain underscoring of its importance if it happens in a constitutional context. Sure. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the Constitution sits there and the judges can use it to strike down legislation. There's an interesting question that we talk about, I suppose, only with our common law students, 
about could there be an unconstitutional constitutional amendment. I don't think we have to face that, although there is an argument in the federal constitution that there are some. Hmm. Um, but this would be kind of super legislation, in a sense. And then the courts will construe it. That's the interplay between the branches of government, That's which right. is yeah. very important. But the Constitution lays down some of the fundamentals that define the rights of individuals and the rights of the state. And it isn't and so just on. symbolic. It yeah. is important to people, to the populace as a whole, and it becomes sometimes legally important. As well. If I could add another example of that, I mean, we talk about some of these, you know, big watershed issues, but one thing that happened um, in 78 was the protection of the right to privacy within our Constitution. And it specifically states that right to privacy has to be held to strict scrutiny, which um, federally is generally the case what the federal what the Supreme Court already does but that could change over time and we're saying on the state level that regardless of what happens that strict that we're requiring that strict scrutiny the highest level of scrutiny of government action is going to be held to protect people's privacy rights which covers everything from illegal search and seizure to a woman's right to choose her reproductive health options so there's it's Big just to sort of underscore what Dean Suffer is saying. We're going to go to a break and then we'll come back and keep the discussion going on some of what happened in 78. Hey, Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And they won't let me do political commentary, so I'm stuck doing energy stuff. But I really like energy stuff, so I'm going to keep on doing it. So join me every Friday on Stan the Energy Man at lunchtime, at noon, on my lunch hour. We're going to talk about everything energy, especially if it begins with the word hydrogen. We're going to definitely be talking about it. We'll talk about how we can make Hawaii cleaner, how we can make the world a better place, just basically save the planet. Even Miss America can't even talk about stuff like that anymore. We got it nailed down here. So we'll see you on Friday at noon with Stan the Energy Man. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. Welcome back. Th let's talk a little more about 78. I'm interested in what each of you, from your own political views, consider the most important things that came out of 78. I've been compiling a bit of a list. As uh, Becky mentioned, I've convened some meetings. I called it the CONCON Salon, and we had a lot of discussions. Becky was a part of that. And we were really trying to think it through as opposed to taking positions and just debating and I'm for, I'm against. We wanted to go beyond that. And some of the things that you've already mentioned are on that list, but there were things also like uh, partially public financed elections came out of 78, term limits for the governor and lieutenant governor, an annual balanced budget requirement, um, Judicial Selection Commission, I think Avi, you mentioned that. Council on Revenues, Tax Review Commission. So, uh, the, the 78 was a, kind of a watershed year, and one of my understandings, and one of the things I've learned was, in particular, the big issue going into it was initiative, recall, and referendum. Those were the, and we should explain what those terms mean, because a lot of people don't know. But there were also surprise issues, and two of those were heralded by two powerful women. One was Frenchie de Soto, who almost single-handedly pushed Hawaiian as a second language and the creation of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, rallied up people like John Wahe and others. And the other was Charlene Ho, who really had been um, working very hard on water issues and really pushed the public trust doctrine and its implications for water. Don't underestimate those Hawaiian women. No, tough, <laughs> tough, tough. You too, including you. So, so um, I'm curious what else that, you know, from your own personal point of view, has had the biggest repercussions over the last couple of decades. It's been 40 years since we had a CONCON, -con, and the question is sort of what has really um, shifted as a result of it in, in your own political thinking, in your own views. Well, there are a lot of factors, of course. The context matters a great deal. So you talked about campaign finance. Uh, that's changed because of the United States Supreme Court. So you couldn't do some of the things that were done. Uh, and in my own view, that's a shame uh, because the First Amendment has been held. Basically, the Supreme Court has said that uh, dollars are expression, and therefore we have to protect dollars. Uh, 
I think that one could, there are still some ways that a state could try to fence that in or perhaps get around it. So it's not, not all is lost, but it does make a difference. In terms of outside money coming That's in right. to try to influence what That's the state right. does. That's right. Um, I think your point about initiative referendum and recall is an important one because some people think that California has become an ungovernable state, it's more than a state in many ways, because every time there is something, and it tends to be progressive legislation, there's an initiative uh, and people tend to vote it down. So if it's too easy to do that, it doesn't all go in one direction. So you have to worry about So just to define terms, what is an initiative? Is it, is it a prop? It's in California, they call them propositions, yeah, I think. Right. And so, what does it do? So for example, this is a, it went to the US Supreme Court. Open housing laws, and then they say, well, this is a terrible thing. Let's do something about this statewide. And they say, OK, you can't do that. And they put it in the Constitution. Uh, similarly, with uh, some protections for those like uh, LGBT in, Cal in Colorado. And they said, well, we won't let Boulder and a few other places protect them. Not going to be able to do that. And the US Supreme Court stepped in and said, wait a minute, that's an unconstitutional thing you've done, even though you put it in the Constitution. So it's when the the populist may be too populist, if you will. And these days, I think, in particular in this country, we're aware of that danger. Yeah. And what about referendum and recall? What are those things for people who may be hearing those terms and puzzling them out? Becky, any comments? or? Yeah, so in both initiative and referendum are ways that citizens can get measures directly and onto a ballot as opposed to having to go through their legislative process. And so it's seen as sort of direct citizen action as opposed to going through the representative democracy. And there's lots of arguments on, on both sides of that. And frankly, I think they're probably in part shaped by which issue, what issue you're talking about and whether or not you think it should be and subject. Not, there are three different And things. then lastly, recall would be, again, a citizen opportunity to undo, essentially, um, something that's been yeah. You want to add to in that? my understanding, in '78, that was the big issue. Those were the three big issues that everybody knew were going to come on the table, and they actually pretty quickly got voted away by narrow margins. Right. That's how I understand it. And then the other, many other issues came on the table in the form of proposed amendments and revisions. Mm -hmm. Becky, I want to go back, and maybe we could put up slide three, and I want to go back to the sequence and the timing. And this slide sure. may be useful, may not be. But uh, can you talk, talk us through this so everybody understands here's what's going to happen yep. roughly in the time frame? So this first navy blue box vote on ConCon is, is, um, is assured. So we're going to have a vote um, on whether or not to have a constitutional convention coming up this general election, November 6, 2018, and we hope that everyone votes. Uh, the second question, um, the legislature in likely in the 2019 legislative session, although they could do it in, in a special session, but likely in the 2019 normal legislative session, which begins January 2019, the legislature would determine by, um, by the last day, which is in May 2019, what the structure is going to look like, where, when, how much how many delegates, et cetera. And they'll likely also set up a schedule for how the delegates will be elected, when, and then when there will be an election for those delegates. Then there will be some period of time that, del that people, citizens, basically anyone who's eligible to vote in the state of Hawaii will be able to run as a delegate um, to the Constitutional Convention. And there will probably be some traditional campaigning happening. Um, encourage people who want to run to knock on doors and go and meet people in their community and hear what their community cares about. But anyhow, that'll likely happen um, probably spring 2020. Um, but again, that's sort of up to what the legislature decides during session. Then we'll have the uh, convention. It should voters vote on it. The convention will convene. It must be at least five months before the 2020 general, which is in November 2020. Uh, but it could be earlier than that. Again, it sort of depends on what the legislature decides. The convention must adjourn, and they must, the convention delegates must put forward to citizens the proposed amendments or revisions at least 30 days before the general election. Um, I would suspect that we, what we know about how early ballots are uh, printed, it would hopefully be more than 30 days, but the Constitution <laughs> right. requires at least 30 days. Uh, and then on November 3rd, 2020, which is the general election two years from now, those proposed amendments will be, should there be any, will be on the ballot for 
all anyone who votes. Well That's done and, and clearly so, but it also emphasizes how close 2020 is. Yeah. Not so far away. No, it isn't. Yeah, and not it's at all. a tight timeline yeah. actually when you think about it. Um, let me add, I want to go back to one of those, which is the actual election of delegates. Can anybody be a delegate? How, what do you have to qualify if you decide to run? If you wanted to run, I wanted to run, not that I'm campaigning. I think the legislature would, mm -hmm. within some parameters, be able to set that. My assumption is anyone who is an eligible voter could run. Could Any citizen it. of the yeah. state? Yeah. yeah. Could, they, could they exclude, for example, sitting politicians? Probably not, yeah, constitutionally. Probably. They're citizens. They still they get could to do discourage, that. but I don't think they could exclude. They could certainly try. I mean, the legislature has all kinds of things that are constitutionally questionable, <laughs> but that would be open to challenge. In '78, one of my understandings that we heard Becky in the Con Con yeah. Salon was that the media, when we had a more solidified media, really lobbied against having the sitting politicians jump in and become delegates. They really wanted it to be a citizen. Of and course, it, the and media, it worked. And it, did, they it seemed to have worked. Almost yeah. entirely but out. Today is a different game. Yeah. It's a very different we, game. We have the scrapbooks. Our librarians have been keeping an archive on the Con Con from 78. Uh, Do you think one of the things I, we've heard from a couple of people who were the alumni and veterans of the 1978 Con Con was that a constitutional convention is sort of a mirror of the times. It's, a, it's the temper of the times that kind of you know, sits on people's mind. What, what, if I can ask you, What's your sense of the mirror? What's when you look in the mirror? What what do we got going on here that may push votes for or against? It's a tough well, question, but why not? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I mean, everybody's going to have a different space on you know talk about what they're seeing and what are important to them individually. I think collectively. Cost of living issues in the state of Hawaii are at the forefront of people's minds. Are at the I think Civil Beat just published a poll not a week ago talking about affordable housing and other cost of living related issues being the number one issue on voters' minds um, right now. So I think that those questions will drive things, but how they drive things exactly, what that means, is I think yet to be yet to be known. I, um, certainly, I think that where some of the fear comes from, including fear that I myself hold. Um, is about whether or not sort of the same environment that existed in 78 to bring life to some of the protections for Native Hawaiians, whether or not that's an environment that we have today, or whether or not, um, whether for a wide range of reasons that, that there are questioning as to whether or not the things that have been established to try to protect those rights continue to be the right way to do it, or whether protecting those rights at all continue to be yep. important. And so, for someone like myself, who's really interested in not only protecting those rights, but in fact fulfilling them, because many of them remain, I think, unfulfilled, um, remains a concern. But OK, are, are the same forces that have prevented us from, for example, um, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs as a 5F, so the Admissions Act 59, there was a section that talked about the use of public trust lands, ceded lands, and how those revenues were to be utilized. And they're called 5F purposes, just the section, just the article. And one of those purposes is for the betterment of Native Hawaiians. There remains, I mean, it's not even really a Big question, gaps. but I mean, there's certainly not 20% of ceded land revenues going to the Office of Foreign Affairs today. And so when we still have sort of these open, it are the same forces that are preventing that from happening. And I'm not even talking necessarily about about um, you know bad forces, just sort of maybe lack of interest forces or lack of understanding of the direness. I mean, there's sort of a variety of things that could influence how people think and feel about whether or not Native Hawaiians should be should be recipients of 5F revenues. That though, if those same forces roll in to a constitutional convention. Does that put at risk whether or not an organization like Office of Hawaiian Affairs, Department of Hawaiian Homeland? I mean, yep. there's a number of things that were really critical in '78 to it that we're still trying to fulfill. So I Work think in that, progress. yeah, I think so. But the big question: cost of living. Yeah. So yeah. we only have a couple seconds left, and I just want to uh, first thank you both for joining us. But also, I want to uh, kind of, it's a good segue. We're going to talk in two more segments later on with a couple other people about these same issues from different angles. Uh, but my pitch to everybody is that if you have an issue you want to protect, uh, get involved and get out there and vote. And if you have a, uh, an issue you want to advocate for, get out there and, and vote on November 6th, an important issue uh, that faces us all and could affect the future of the state of Hawaii. 
Thank you so much for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you.